think in a sense this second archive set was slightly easier to work out because initially the whole idea for doing, for me, for doing some of this was all those kind of unreleased B-sides we've had for a long time. Um, you know, we never come out in certain countries, we always had a chance to be released on one album. That's how this whole thing started, really. Whereupon you then divide into, into the Peter years and the Phil years. Um, and although on this, obviously, Phil's, on, on Phil's era, there's kind of less unusual stuff, there is that whole catalogue of B-sides. It's for fans that went out and bought all those 45s, went out and bought all the LPs, and, and didn't, you know, bought some dodgy copy from Italy of some B-side that was scratched because, you know, it had been left out on the floor without a cover. You know, but they liked the song. For years, the fans said, let's have the B-sides out all together so we can hear them. Cause they, you know, they were in some countries, not in other countries. And so, once you've got that, you haven't got enough, you haven't got enough for a box set, you've got enough to make a start of a box set. And then you start working out what else sort of makes sense to go with it. Well, we went through, obviously, all the, the tracks that, that had never been used on, on the proper albums. Uh, a, which have been used as A-sides, B-sides and, and extras around the place. And, and really used most of those, a couple that didn't make it because um, there was one we all hated and there was one that Phil particularly hated and so decided just not to include them, you know. So all the others are there. But there's some songs on there which are really great actually. I mean, one forgets about them because they weren't on the record, therefore they, you never hear them on the radio, you never hear them by accident. Uh, and one thing, Hearts on Fire, which is one of my favourite songs. I remember we wrote it around the time We Can't Dance. That was a great song. And On the Shoreline is another one that's, that's very strong, very Zeppelin kind of groove to it. But the other stuff is... Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, another one, I think, from that same Feeding the Fire, which is from the same We Can't Dance period. But otherwise, they really go back to um, about the time of Wind and Wuthering. And then the rest of the stuff was really just live material trying to make a decision on and using no live tracks that had ever been used before and using live tracks from, from any era, any place. And I was amazed actually when I listened to all the stuff, how many tracks we'd never used actually, because we've done a lot of live albums, as many people will tell you, I think. It's supposed to be a well-documented live band. But um, so you missed out on certain eras, in fact, and, and some one or two quite good pieces, like um, Duke's Travels, I think, particularly, which is, which is very strong. I think a lot of people, a lot of fans, certainly would be um, excited about this box set. And it is, it is a way of, I mean, you know, if you're sort of putting everything in one place, uh, it's, it's all done now. I did have a few things to say about some of the choices of song, and some I won, some I lost, and. Um, but with Mama, that was a surprise to me. I mean, I knew they, when they said they were going to do it, I said, oh, that sounds interesting. But I mean, I wasn't here when they went through the tapes to find out which was the best one. But I mean, I heard the, uh, the rough one before they edited it to be the final one. And it seemed to be a, a really interesting idea for people to hear. We used to try and jam sometimes onto the onto the master reels just to see what we'd get out of it in case there's anything worth using and also give you a chance of just going back and looking at it in detail you know um, and obviously in this particular version you've got the verses pretty much how they were with, with, with uh, Phil just sort of singing nonsense but then the middle which obviously hadn't evolved at that point was you, know, you can see sort of sort of forming a couple of chords are there happening and you get an idea of what we were aiming for <laughs> And the end section I think is quite interesting because it just includes lots of just what typical of what we used to do all the time, which was just we'd, we might put up a, a groove, you know, with the drum machine and just play around on top of it. And, um, you know, and it becomes almost a sort of like a little pastoral sequence at the end there almost, which is sort of just typical of just, just jamming around. And a couple of which just actually sound quite nice and might have been, you know, might have been usable had we decided to go that direction. I 
think it was nice for us to show to people how we worked. I mean, I've always, I think people never realized how, to use a very well-used word, organic we were. I mean, it really was, a lot of our writing just came from jamming, improvising, uh, and that version of Mama was kind of how we used to do it, you know. We had a sort of working idea, a bit of a framework, got a drum machine going, a mood, an atmosphere, and feel kind of bluesing on top. And so many songs came out of that sort of style of writing. Um, and it's quite nice to show how the song and the character is there, even at that early stage. Twelve-inch stuff is the, some of those songs are fantastic. I mean, Invisible Touch. When we heard that, because that was done by John Patoka, who did my No Jacket Required Twelve Inches, and he did a fantastic one on Invisible Touch, and we ended up using that arrangement, part of it, taking the best of it anyway, and putting it in the live show. Well, that was all done at the stage when everyone did a twelve inch. You know, you got to make a twelve inch of the single. And it obviously worked for dance acts because they sold a lot of copies and never played a lot. For us, no one really bought them apart from the sort of, you know, the, the, the collector fans. But I think the I Can't Dance one is very good. I always like that one, actually. Uh, the one's on the album. It definitely brought something different to it. They completely... That's, that's one of the... One of the verse, a 12-inch something that I've been involved with, where the song has become a different song altogether, and I almost like it more. It sort of turns the song inside out because it uses the piano riff as the main riff throughout the song, and the guitarist sort of comes in as the extra, so it's the reverse of what we did on the, on the thing, and I think that works quite well, actually. We did audition when Peter left because we wanted a singer and I was always singing the songs to teach the guys to sing so I kind of got pretty good at it you know and uh, they kind of got used to my voice and we did take a guy into the studio we, but, but really we didn't find a singer purely because there's nothing there's no one we really met that we wanted in the family um, there are plenty of good singers, but just for some reason. And there's no, no, nothing wrong with the people we met. I mean, if anybody that was at the audition was listening to this, then... You know, it was actually nothing like that. I mean, we just... you just feel a thing, you know? And uh, sometimes the person was really great and fitted in, but we didn't really think his voice suited the band, or we had a great voice and we didn't like him as a person. You know? Anyway, um, I got the job because we couldn't find anybody else. It was literally that. seen Phil so much as a singer, a, back, a backing singer, yes. Um, probably harder for us to see because he was in-house. Although I think when you think about it, it's so hard finding someone from outside your circle. We've been together as a group for quite a few years when Peter left. To find someone inside, A, for us, there were no new faces and no new characters to deal with. And B, probably looking back, the audience knew him and liked him and loved him, so there wasn't a great transition to go over that. They wanted him to do well. My drink of music is playing Voices can faintly I think we all sort of just carried on regardless really. I don't remember, I don't know how much we each of us worried about it. I mean you sort of thought that it would work it resolve itself one way or another. You'd find a singer. You might have to you know, in the end you thought you might have to just plump for a for a singer and, and sort of kind of, you know, use his vocal talents rather than anything else about him maybe. Um, I don't know, I, I sort of I think we were enjoying ourselves so much just writing. I, I remember Trick of the Tower just being a really enjoyable record to do because the lamb had been a bit of a struggle to be honest. I mean because it's been time things to sort of keep to and although some of the stuff came very easily other bits were a bit more difficult and there were more arguments in the band and you know it wasn't the happiest of times and so Trick of the Tale was sort of like a breath of fresh air really and things seemed to come very easily lots of ideas around and um, and we had a great time doing it I think on something I did.
Live performances have always helped us. We've always been a great band live, even when Peter was singing with the band. In a way, being in a band is great because you've got two jobs. You know, you write and make records, and then you go and play it on stage. And the, the, the two parts are so different. But they kind of work very well together. I was sort of amazed by it at certain times. You know, you go out on stage and find all these people, and you think, they all come to see why, you know? And, and the, in, but it, nevertheless enjoyed it, really, I suppose. I mean, I love just, just writing the music. And something very exciting about writing music that you feel is going to get a big audience, um, you know? Uh, there, there's some sort of quiet, there's a thrill in that when you sort of, you get something that works and you think, oh, that'd be great, that'll work really well. Yeah. Playing with them live was great because um, you get so much of this energy off of the people and the band is so strong, so powerful. I've never worked in a band like this since or before. For the bulk of our career I think we've been better live than actually been on record. We've had some very good moments on record but I think a lot of our songs just seem to get more fire on stage and it's hard, always hard to capture that on record. Um, so some of the live recordings, when we, when we checked them out, um, I was pleased to hear they got that sort of fire in them. I've had a great time doing it, and, and the, the live experience was, you know, not to be matched for me. I think moving here, in, in our studio made a big difference to the records because we always when, when we were writing the thing and there was an energy we were never able to capture that because we always had to go in the rehearsal room and do that because it was too expensive to go to a studio and when we got our own studio of course we could come in here and and record as we wrote it and things like Mama, uh, Abacab were, were recorded almost as, as we wrote them so. So it had, you know, we began to be a bit better on record than the um, in the later albums. I think. So many of our songs start with a mood and an atmosphere and a setting, and then a vocal line and a vocal start with a lyric. But it becomes, it's a natural thing, it's not a sort of a, a thought out thing, which I've always felt part of our strength. The one thing about anything you all write together, you probably all like, because it wouldn't have got through to be a popular thing you wouldn't want to work on if you hadn't all liked it. So I think in a sense, some of the best songs have been like that. The relationship is based around music, I mean, there's not about it, I mean, that's why we, we see each other, did see each other, whatever, was, was because we, we got on well, you know, what, what happened when we were in the same room and writing worked really well, I think. I just think of the police, for example, where you can, re I can't really get the three of them in the same room anymore, you know, they hate each other, you know, in a, nice, in a, in a nicely aggressive way, whereas we really, you know, really love each other, I think, I mean, we spent 25, well, since 1970, so it's 30 years, but for the last five years, of course, five or six years, I haven't been in the band, but stayed in touch, you know. I mean, I, I, I call Tony and Mike, uh, especially in the last six months or so, pretty pretty often. They played at the wedding. We all played at my wedding. Um, and same with Peter, but particularly Tony and Mike. You know, good friends. And um, so it's kind of, you know, it's nice to have these excuses to come back together again, really. It's obviously something to do with egos, it has to be, I think. 
Um, I know that some groups would you know, have problems with this, and I think it would be fair to say, for example, if um, Phil had had the sort of success he had later, when we were about 22, 23, that the band wouldn't have survived it. You know, I don't think, because the younger can't take it. By the time it happened, we were sort of in our 30s and things, and it was sort of easier to take, and the band was pretty well established by that stage and everything, so you didn't feel totally that you were riding on his sort of, in his slipstream, you know. It's to do with money. We've never had a row about money. I mean, I soften it's just such a shame. You're with guys and you see these bands who worked together for years, they were close for years, and they always seem to fall out over money. Now, Genesis used to argue all the time about music. But to be honest, never. I mean, I can't remember one single argument about money. I think because that was never really our reason for doing things, our motivation. And so that's always sort of something we never really they had a great manager to, which helped. Um, so that never came up and in between us. I think it was always our problems and our relationship was always with music and friendship. My time with the band from 78 to 92 was probably the best time in my life as far as working with a group because not only is it about the music that you're playing, it's about the people that you are working with. And I still today, you know, get along with these guys great. They get along with each other. So part of that is, you know, a lot of bands break up for a lot of very different reasons. And some, most of the time is personality clashes. I don't think that happens here. So my experience has been a, as a great experience from, um, even from a family standpoint. When I look back, what comes to mind is the fact that it was long. <laughs> there was a lot of it. Occasionally you look back on your life and you think, gosh, where did all those years go? What have I done? And then the best thing is you get, you get out the photograph album and you see all these tours you've done and all the dates and like you kind of appreciate, I think, um, the ground you've covered, people you've played to, people who bought your records. I've always said that the three of us, you know, I'm not discounting Peter, but I, don't, I can't speak for Pete, but certainly for me, Tony and Mike, I, we, we get on great and, uh, and I would definitely see us doing something together again, but maybe, maybe not calling it Genesis, you know, I think that would, that would put it in a certain place and it would, it, you know, would prevent us from doing anything other than Genesis, as opposed to just three people getting together and writing music and calling it something else, you know. Oh, it's been incredibly satisfying. Really. I mean, I, just writing songs, you know, is, some, is a, such a is something I love doing, really. And and being able to do that for such a long time, uh, and obviously getting a reaction to it is, is fantastic too. That that's the thing. You play a song, particularly live on stage, and you get a response and on a record, and it's a hit or whatever. You know, it's a it's an incredibly you feel very lucky to have done that, really. I mean, it does give you those incredible highs, but incredible lows. And, and uh, but in the main, the highs make it all worthwhile. It brings back all kinds of memories, good, bad, funny, indifferent. But, um, and you know, apart from anything else, it's an excuse to see your mates. You know. I can dance, I can talk. Only thing about me is the way that I walk. I can dance, I can sing. I'm just standing here and selling. Oh, I'm changing everything.
perfect taste. 